been many famous contenders for the coveted title of champion fighter aircraft of World War II, but few could match the knockout punch delivered by the P-51 Mustang. Mustang pilots dominated the series of epic air battles fought over Germany, which finally destroyed Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe. It's one-to-one -one combat, and you gotta be aggressive. If you think you're going to be defensive in a fighter plane, you're lost. I wanted to be the tip of the spear. I thought that was the right place to be. Its unique blend of superb handling, high performance, devastating firepower, and long-range endurance made the Mustang unbeatable. It was the finest, as far as I'm concerned. For many, the P-51 Mustang remains the ultimate fighter aircraft. Using archive film and color reenactment, Battle Stations enters the dangerous world of the crack Mustang fighter pilots. In the late summer of 1940, Britain's Royal Air Force was locked in the deadly struggle with Germany's Luftwaffe, which became known as the Battle of Britain. The situation was critical. The British Spitfire and Hurricane fighters were good machines, but they were not being built fast enough to meet the threat of a German invasion. One solution was to import fighters from America. We soldiered on almost alone. We did know, I think, what we wanted, and we had some super brains who were ordering these things. We knew what we wanted, and we got it. The North American Aviation Company had the basis of a new high-performance, long-range fighter design already on the drawing board. After just 117 days, they rolled out the finished airframe. It was a sleek and streamlined machine, which reached 382 miles per hour during early test flights, making it faster than the British Spitfire at low altitude, despite carrying twice as much fuel, which gave it twice the range. But at high altitude, its Allison engine lost power and it took almost twice as long as the Spitfire to reach 20,000 feet. Although it was unsuited to high altitude combat, its high speed and long range made it the ideal weapon for low level ground attack missions. The RAF placed an order for 620 of the new aircraft, which it christened the Mustang. That's a wild horse, isn't it? Um... It didn't have wild traits, it was a good airplane. And, uh, but Mustang is, I mean, everybody would like a good Mustang horse. Yes, good name for it. This is the Mustang, the fastest army cooperation aircraft in the world. They've already been in action, ground strafing the enemy in the Axis occupied countries across the English Channel. The RAF pilots like them. German soldiers in northern France do not. And the Americans showed surprisingly little interest in the potent new weapon they had developed for the RAF. They had no wish to be drawn into the war that was devastating Europe. But in December 1941, the whole course of World War II was changed as Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and America entered the war. It was agreed that defeating Hitler in Europe would be the first priority for the Allied forces. Britain had narrowly escaped one invasion, but now there came another, a friendly invasion, as thousands of American troops poured into Britain to help defeat fascism. Among them were young airmen, fresh out of training, full of confidence and itching to get into the fight, whatever the risks. Now look, fellas, let's face it. This is our business. 
In war, there's only one place for you to be, on your toes. You know, a fighter pilot basically is an individualist. Nobody has any ego in his family because he has it all. Did you pipe that fair weather pilot telling me? I can handle this. I was young and a cocky, too. In fact, um, a conceited son of a bitch. <laughs> no, I, I thought I was pretty good. In fact, uh, you probably never heard of a pilot that didn't think he was the number one fighter pilot in the world. I, hell, I've met thousands of them. To stay alive, you've got to act alive. It's the deed that counts, not what you say. It's the deed, your actions. Learn and live. If you don't, you won't. If you're going to come in combat against someone else, you know you're going to beat them. If you don't have that feeling, if you think you're going to be defensive in a fighter plane, you're lost. If you don't think you're a winner, you're in the wrong business. OK? OK. The Americans certainly needed all the confidence they could get if they were to defeat the battle-hardened pilots of the Luftwaffe. They were about to enter the big league of air fighting. Well, we certainly know where we are now. Young cadets in full parade. The youthful hope and pride of the Army Air Forces. And we mean it. Yes, they're the best young flying blood in the world. And America was equally proud of the planes they would be flying. America's newest fighter plane, the P-47 Thunderbolt, has left the drafting boards and is now in mass production. One of the main contenders for the title of Top Gun American Fighter was the P-47 Thunderbolt. It was a massive machine, which tipped the scales at more than eight tons. Thousands of rounds of ammunition are stored in its wings. Guns are tested on the ground. Thunderbolts in name, they pack thunderbolts of firepower. At low level, the Thunderbolt's weight limited its performance. But the higher it got, the better it flew. And at altitude, it was more than a match for the German fighters. But the Thunderbolt's huge engine gulped fuel at the rate of more than one gallon every 30 seconds, which severely limited its range. And range was the key to victory in the European air war. What America badly needed was a fighter which could escort its bombers from their bases in Britain all the way to the German capital, Berlin. In the summer of 1943, the Allies launched a combined bombing offensive against Nazi Germany. It was a 24-hour operation. The British bombed by night, the Americans by day. The American campaign had been based on the belief that the heavily armed Flying Fortress and Liberator bombers could defend themselves against attacking German fighters. But the daylight raid suffered heavy losses, and it soon became obvious that the bombers needed the protection of a fighter escort. The prime targets were the centers of German industrial production and the capital city, Berlin. 550 miles from the American bases in southeast England. Most escort missions were entrusted to the heavyweight Thunderbolts, which would fly to the limit of their radius of action, about 200 miles from base. By adding extra fuel tanks, the range was increased to more than 300 miles, still well short of Berlin. Their sole task was to protect the bombers and under the dynamic leadership of celebrated pilots like Colonel Don Blakesley, the Americans began to earn a formidable reputation as aggressive fighters. Don Blakesley was sort of a fighter pilot god on a pedestal. Everybody knew who he was, and he was a great leader. Colonel Don Blakesley, great leader of fourth group. I actually liked the business. It's probably a horrible thing to say, but I... I got a hell of a good kick out of it, particularly when you're winning. And my feeling was, if you see it, you go after it. Just aggressive, just be aggressive, and uh, it worked. The Germans soon learned to respect these formidable fighters. 
but they also learn to exploit their limited range. As we were going in and we were reaching our maximum range, you could see the Germans out there circling, waiting. They knew exactly when we had to go. Just when they were needed most, the Thunderbolts were forced to turn for home or risk running out of fuel. Now the bomber crews were on their own, knowing that the German fighters were lying in wait for them. That was rather disheartening when you saw them turn back because you knew you were going to catch it from then on. And as soon as we would leave, you could look back and you could see the tangling going on. And this was a horrible sight. And there was nothing we could do. Fighter at 6 o'clock. This is what a gunner sees, a speck in the sky. That's a fighter. And then a blink. That means he's firing at you. 2,300 rounds a minute. You see those leading edges light up like neon signs, and you know that they're shooting at you. And they, and they mean business. They must have got a direct hit on the bombs because there was an explosion, little pieces of tinsel falling down, and the smoke ring started to form. And by the time we got out, the smoke ring was still in the air. That's all there was left of them. Sad. That kind of thing was dreamlike, to see this panorama of destruction in the sky and little dots sometimes jumping out of the bombers. People, guys, jumping out, some chutes opening, sometimes you see a dot disappear, just the dot. You guys get out of that plane. Bail out. There's one. He come out of the bomb bay. Yeah, I see him. There's a tail gunner coming out. Right in front of me, his tail gunner bailed out, and he didn't have his chute snapped on. And he had it in his hand, but the slipstream took it away from him. And I, I saw him fall, and uh, he had to go 26,000 feet with no visible means of support. Uh, the only thing I could think of, well, he's got plenty of time to say his prayers on the way down. Those bomber crews were brave men. What they did, I would not want to do. The only time that you feel miserable, as far as I was concerned, is when I watched the bombers going down and you couldn't do a darn thing about it. And you know they're not gonna make it. And it is the most disheartening experience. Sometimes you come back and you're practically in tears. You knew that there are 10 guys in there that aren't going to be home that night. And there was nothing I, as a fighter pilot, could do about it. The need for long-range fighter escorts was proved beyond any doubt on the 17th of August, 1943. During raids on Schweinfurt and Regensburg, 60 aircraft, each with a crew of 10 men, were lost. During a single week in October, 148 bombers and 1,500 crew members failed to return from bombing missions. The operation was too costly to sustain. If the American bombing campaign over Germany was to succeed, an effective long-range fighter had to be found. A few people were convinced that the answer lay with the neglected Mustang. It had the range, it had the speed, it had the firepower. All it needed was the ability to fight at high altitude. Back in 1942, a team of Rolls-Royce engineers had tried replacing the Mustang's Allison engine with their Merlin, the engine that powered the British Spitfire. Unlike the Allison, it was highly efficient at high altitude. The result was an instant and dramatic improvement in performance.
The Merlin actually delivered more power at 25,000 feet than the Allison had on takeoff. And it did it on half the fuel consumed by the Thunderbolts engine. The RAF and the US Army Air Force were suitably impressed. They placed large orders for the Mustang. It was agreed that the American-built Packard Merlin should become the standard engine for all future production. I don't think the Americans would have had that sort of fighter if we hadn't tactfully got in the Merlin. I think it's one of the greatest examples of, of cooperation between two, two countries in trouble. I think it shows that all those brilliant minds could actually get together and work together without jealousies. The final pieces of the Mustang jigsaw were put in place when the P-51D was introduced in May 1944. The new model was redesigned with a low-back fuselage and a bubble canopy of clear plastic, giving an unrestricted field of vision while creating an entirely new and distinctive profile. The Mustang was now a thoroughbred, the undisputed champion in the Allied fighter stable. Even on the ground, with its wheels down, it looked like it was going forward. It was beautifully streamlined. It, it had all the right contours, I guess. It looked like a fighter plane should look. And it has a sound all of its own. There's no sound for like the P-51. The Mustang is the pilot's airplane. You have to understand that. You climb into that plane, and that airplane becomes a part of you. It responded so well to the controls, it just felt good to fly it. We used to say, uh, if you wanted to turn left, you roll your eyeballs left, and that was about all you needed. You were a part of the plane. It was as if you were a bird. It flew beautifully. It responded perfectly. It flew with power and grace, and it was gorgeous to, to be in that plane and flying. I really think it was a love affair between uh, a young pilot and his airplane. We felt that we were uh, capable of doing anything we wanted to do in the airplane. The enemy was defeated in our mind when we crawled into the, into the cockpit. They had been given the most potent fighter in the Allied arsenal. It had the best engine available. Its six heavy machine guns, three in each wing, could unleash a total of 1,880 rounds. It carried over 400 gallons of fuel with two disposable drop tanks fitted under the wings and could fly more than 2,000 miles. To have been given a, an airplane like this, a P-51 Mustang fighter, as my own, I felt terrific. At last, the American bombers had the protection they so desperately needed. A high-performance fighter that could escort them all the way to Berlin and back. It was a turning point in the war. The Mustang, the P-51, the longest range fighter in the world. Speed, fast climb, quick dive, tight turn. Into these great fighters, America poured its genius, its millions of man-hours of labor, its faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed these men. I didn't have the faintest idea what the hell was going on. I knew why we were fighting, but uh, I didn't know how. The first time I really realized that I was in combat was I saw my wingman shot up and going down. 
And I had never seen the enemy aircraft that did it. I know at the time I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing here? I'm way out of my league. If they were to survive in combat, the young pilots had to learn, and learn fast. You still can feel your heart pounding pretty fast. And uh, yeah, there's some fear, the first mission or two, that how's this really going to go? <laughs> I was scared to death, and I'll tell you, anybody that says they weren't scared to death is a liar. I was new and nervous, and uh, with the gyrations of the plane, I, uh, I started to, my, I had to throw up. And when I got uh, back to Steeple Morton, landed, oh, I felt terrible. I, I felt maybe I, I didn't have what it takes felt humiliated. Came up to the hard stand and the crew chief climbs on the wing and the canopy goes back. And I saw him look and I, I told him, I'm terribly sorry, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I'll, I'll help you clean it up. And he said, look, I've seen worse and I felt wonderful. It meant there were others too. It wasn't just me, but those three words were a psychological turning point for me. And I never threw up again. I felt I could do it. Each pilot depended on his crew chief. He led the ground crew that serviced and armed the fighter. They were all dedicated to the pilot's welfare, provided he looked after their aircraft, as well as they looked after him. The crew chiefs felt it was their plane. The plane was charged out to the crew chief, not to the pilot. And he took care of that thing as if it was a, a little baby. Right, he did everything but put a diaper on it. I'm still fighting with my old crew chief for 55 years as to who owned my airplane. You talk to a crew chief, he owned it. You talk to a pilot, the pilot owned it. He says he owned it, and you only fly because I let you. When the airplane is on the ground, it belongs to the crew chief. It's his airplane. And it's almost like a father with his daughter. And you come as a high school kid, and you're going to take his daughter out, you know? So he looks you over, and he checks you out and everything, and you're very careful. You bring my daughter back, and it's the same thing with the airplane. But when you climb into that airplane, and the crew chief and the assistant crew chief buckle you in, they snap on your harness, and the umbilical cord is tied, it's no longer his airplane. It's my bird. It was my girlfriend. It was my baby. The Mustang pilots liked to personalize their aircraft. Most were named, often in honor of wives or girlfriends back home. At that time, uh, Walt Disney's motion picture, Dumbo, had come out. And in Dumbo, there was a song that uh, the mother sings to, the, uh, to Dumbo, Baby Mine, Don't You Cry, so forth. And that song used to go through my head when I was flying. So I said, that's a perfect name. So I called Baby Mine. Then whenever I went out with a girl, they'd say, what did you name your plane? I said, I named it after you, Baby Mine. And it worked. Day after day, huge formations of American bombers and fighters would set out to make the dangerous journey into German airspace. They flew from dozens of airfields dotted across the rural landscape of southeast England. We were sort of like a flying gun platform in a flying gas tank. That's what you were. Because every inch of that plane practically was loaded with gas and ammunition. As the air crews shuttled each day between the peace of the English countryside with its water meadows and thatched cottages and the full horror of modern airborne warfare, they shared a strange, disjointed life. Like Roman gladiators, they could be celebrating a victory one day and mourning a lost comrade the next. 
The only certainty was that each mission could be their last. I always knew I was coming back. It's always the old story if uh, there's a hundred fighter pilots in a room and the old man said, this mission is so dangerous, only one of you is coming back. You'll look at all the others and say, you poor fellows. A fellow in my barracks had a chess board and he and I ran a, an ongoing chess game at all times. And we often said, well, this is to guarantee that both of us are coming back because <laughs> we want to see who wins this chess game. And it's so random. You don't know where it's going to happen or to whom. We would really feel bad if we lost some of our people. And we'd often wonder what has happened to them, what happened. And in the debriefing, no one would really know. They just didn't come back. Or someone would see them bailing out, or someone would see them going into the ground. But we never really knew what happened after that. He was there today, he was there yesterday, and he won't be there tomorrow. This was the highly charged world of the crack Mustang units, which the Luftwaffe pilots had learned to respect. They were certainly a tough bunch to meet in combat, and many pilots had notched up the five kills needed to qualify for the unofficial title of fighter ace. Being a fighter pilot in combat is always a matter of goals. You want to destroy your first enemy airplane. So once you've destroyed the first, then you want, you're, you become greedy. You want four more to, so you can become an ace. Then you become greedier yet because now you want to destroy more than anybody else in the group. It's just a matter of wanting more all the time. When that P-51 engine turns over and each of the cylinders hit with the one explosion after the other and a roar. You don't hear the noise, you feel it in your stomach, in your gut. You're strapped in tight, you roll up the canopy, you push the throttle forward, and you go. several mornings when we were escorting and the sun was just coming up. And it looked like a silver road in the sky with those bombers. It was an amazing sight, one that I'll never forget. A thousand bomber mission meant that there were 700 fighters escorting the thousand bombers. There were 10 men in each bomber, so that's 10,700 men that were flying in any one day. This happened on a daily basis. It must have been terrifying to look up and see 1,500 contrails that would whiten the sky as we swept in over Germany and watching for those telltale white streamers would be the German anti-aircraft gunners and fighter pilots determined to defend their homeland, whatever the cost. Flying several thousand feet above the bombers, the fighter escorts would weave to and fro constantly on the lookout for the enemy. If there's one characteristic that you need to be a fighter pilot, it's a neck that turns. If you're up there and flying at, say, 22, 25,000 feet, there's a heck of a lot of sky, and you're constantly looking around, not only to protect the bombers, but to protect yourself. We love to see them escort. Um, 
because we knew when they were around we were not likely to get any fighter attacks or if we did they would be chased off in a hurry but we thought the fighter escort that took us all the way to berlin and back that was really something great escort duty could be lonely work with only the minimum of radio contact to break the isolation you didn't hear swishing or anything like that of wind going by all you heard was the noise of this powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engine in front of you. And you hoped you heard that noise through the entire flight. The pilot would regularly switch between the Mustang's five fuel tanks, draining the external tanks first. They would be dropped before going into action. Escort missions could often last for more than six hours, and pilot fatigue was always a problem. You were the only person in the plane, of course. You were the pilot, you were the navigator, and you were the gunner. When I got up high there, like 22, 23,000 feet, and I might not have, no one else was around, I had this terrible lonesome feeling with the earth way down there. When you get up at altitude, it's 50 degrees below zero centigrade outside that plane. And when you have an eighth of an inch aluminum between you, it doesn't insulate you, it conducts the cold into the cockpit, so it is cold. Numbed by the cold, dazzled by the blinding sun, and deafened by the roar of his engine, his senses were dulled, and it was easy to lose concentration. I think more than the fatigue, and I have to be candid about it, uh, was the, uh, the boredom, the actual boredom of flying a long-range escort mission and not getting any action at all. Because you'd often wonder, what am I doing out here, you know? Why don't these fellows come up? Why don't we get a little excitement going? Suddenly, the radio would burst into life with a shouted warning as the German fighters pounced on the bomber formation below. It was instant. We dropped tanks and went into them. We were supposed to defend the bombers. That was our responsibility. And we always attacked. We always attacked, no matter how many. To hit a moving target at speed involved complex but instinctive calculations by the pilot. It's just like playing football, throwing a pass. You just had to lead them and, and take a guess. And my marksmanship was good. Tenths of a second meant something. If you're going 400 miles an hour, that's 600 feet a second, okay? And in a tenth of a second, you're 60 feet away from where you were. That doesn't give you very much time to ponder what your next action is. You've got to do it in real time fast, very fast. The best way to do it is to fly up their butt and let them have it. That works every time. I'd say at least 50% of the time, the, the victim was unaware that he was being attacked. And, and that was the ideal situation for getting a kill, but you sneak up on a guy and doesn't even know you're there, and then you blow him out of the sky. We flew right under a flight of 109s. My wingman, Bert Stiles, was yelling, 109s, let's get out of here. And I just said, don't panic, Bert. <laughs> he was fairly new, but don't panic. I pulled in behind him and I thought, boy, we're gonna hit something here. And Bert's screaming on to me again, let's get out of here, let's get out of here. He sees that there's another flight following that flight and we're in between them, and I'm fat, numb, and happy until I realized that those sounds I heard outside the cockpit were not my engine backfiring, but 20 millimeter shells exploding. And then I knew Burke knew more than I did. I slammed the stick over to the left and kicked the right rudder just as hard as it could to snap roll the airplane down into the clouds again. Got down below, everything's nice, peaceful down there. Once a running dogfight had developed, 
the odds were more even. Combat quickly became a confused series of chance encounters and narrow escapes. I looked to left, and there was an ME-109 shooting at me, coming through this break in the clouds. And you could see the black smoke coming from the wings as he was firing, but he was head on to me. I yelled, break left, yellow flag. Attempts to outdive an attacker often ended with a high-speed chase at low level. With no chance to bail out, it meant almost certain death for the loser. He knew he was going to crash, so he pulled up trying to get altitude to bail out. And he didn't quite make it. The parachute didn't quite open, and, and of course, I saw him hit the ground. And that was a, a very... Uh, um, well, it was a, a difficult moment, let's say. Then you realize those people are just like I am. You know, uh, he's, he's a fighter pilot and I was too. All this happens in a matter of seconds. And that's a long time, seconds. The German capital, Berlin was ringed by hundreds of anti-aircraft guns. As the bombers neared their target, they had no choice but to fly straight into the barrage of exploding shells. Now the escorting fighter pilots could do nothing except watch. Even the Mustang couldn't fight the flag. When you were on a bomb round, you knew that bombardier, his bomb site was controlling the airplane, and. You knew that he wasn't going to take any evasive action. No way he could. And so you were sort of a sitting duck. When I talked to fighter pilots, uh, they said, boy, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. You know, you have to flying through all that flak. We don't, we don't mess with that. Then I say, well, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes either. But uh, it just seemed to me like the, what they were doing was a heck of a lot more dangerous than what we were doing. Once the bombers had delivered their deadly cargo and cleared enemy airspace, the escort fighters could use up any remaining ammunition on targets of opportunity at ground level. Luftwaffe bases, road convoys and supply trains were the favorite targets. We were authorized to go down on the deck and then you have a lot of fun there. Anything that moves, you shoot it. But ground attacks were highly dangerous operations. For every Mustang shot down by enemy aircraft, five were lost to ground fire. You come in over the treetops, you come up like this, and as soon as you came up, tracer bullets, all these red golf balls would be coming at you. My mind flipped back to when I was a little kid sitting in the dentist chair. I thought, it's not going to hurt long. And that's what I thought every time that I was in a situation like that. It won't hurt long. As the bombs rained down on German industrial cities, they tore the heart out of the Nazi war machine. We knew that we were causing a lot of devastation down there. And uh, it bothered me a little sometimes, the fact that uh, we sometimes dropped through an overcast, so we weren't hitting a military target, we were just hitting the city. And uh, I rather imagined sometimes that my bombs might be killing somebody that I'd rather not kill. The crack German fighting units that had once dominated the air war now found themselves running out of everything, from spare parts and fuel to serviceable aircraft and trained pilots. Toward the end of the war, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel, and uh, these kids, uh, I don't know how much training they had, but it was obvious they didn't have too much. So, uh, like shooting fish in a barrel. And if it's the enemy, I don't mind shooting fish in a barrel.
On the 14th of January, 1945, Mustangs notched up 161 kills. During a series of turkey shoots on the 16th of April, more than 700 German aircraft were destroyed, mostly on the ground. More than 80 aircraft were destroyed in a single attack on one airfield. Hitler's once mighty Luftwaffe was finished. I didn't dislike the Germans. I hated the son of a bitches. So that took care of a lot of my problems because uh, if I thought I could get one, I'd do a certain number. If I figured I could get a thousand, I'd have done a hell of a lot more. The Allies were now masters of the skies, and without fighter cover, the German ground forces were at their mercy as they steadily advanced into the very heart of Germany. Hermann Goering, the chief of Hitler's Luftwaffe, knew only too well the part played by the Mustang in his defeat. When I saw the fighters over Berlin, he told his captors, I knew the jig was up. When the war in Europe finally ended in May 1945, the Mustang still played a crucial role in the Pacific. But its glory days as a long-range escort fighter were almost over. That was a hell of a plane. It was one of a kind in its day. I mean, it was the finest as far as I'm concerned. You never forget, I gotta tell you this. I think what it is, uh, uh, that was the, the only thing I've ever done in my life uh, that did anything for mankind. And so you never forget it. I dream about missions today. I dream about what 